If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, you will live also. Verse 20. At that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will, by, will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the words which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you, if you love me. You would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass that you may believe. I will no longer uh, talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. But that the, word, that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandments, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for the work that you're doing uh, in this church. God, I thank you for the work that you're doing around the world. Lord, as we are reminded about, um, God, you working in Kenya. Um, Lord, just as much as you're working here and the fact that you give us an opportunity, Lord, to uh, participate in that. Um, Lord, it's a beautiful thing. Um, God, I pray this morning as we uh, look at your word, Lord, some awesome truth that you share with your disciples. Uh, Lord, that we would heed it, God, that your spirit, as we're going to look at today, that the spirit of truth, God, would teach us the things that you want us to know. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you guys remember last week in John chapter uh, 14, verses 1 through 14, uh, Jesus says to his disciples, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions or many dwelling places, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Then in verse 6 he says, uh, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We talked about what that means. And then later on around verses 13 and 14, he, he was talking about prayer. And he said, if you ask anything in my name, the Father will give it to you. We talked about how that wasn't a blank check that you can say whatever you want and tell God what you want, he's going to give it to you. But praying in the name of Jesus means that you're praying according to his will, according to his merit, according to his character. And if you pray in line with the will of God, God will always answer that prayer. Today, John chapter 14, verse 15, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Now at this point, you're probably thinking, I should have skipped church today because this is probably going to be one of those convicting messages. He's right out the gate, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying, if you love me, you should keep his commandments. Now this is a powerful verse, especially for those people that come to church on Sunday and that hear a lot about a relationship with Jesus, but they look at their own life and they say, well, I don't really get that. I don't really have that. I come to church, I hear other people talk about how close of a relationship, I need to take Bobby's advice and breathe, how close of a relationship that others have with Jesus, and I don't seem to have it. This, this verse is really the key, because you might show up, you might believe, but the question is, are you obeying? Jesus says, if you love me, you're to keep my commandments. If you love me, 
This is interesting because we live in a world where love is all about emotion, it's all about feelings, but we need to understand that true love really doesn't have much to do with feelings as it does to do with actions and choices. Jesus says, if you truly do love me, you're going to choose to do what I say. In uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, John writes, we love him because he first loved us. So how can I love God more, according to 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, the more that I learn about God's love for me, the more I'm going to love him. So when we spend our time learning about how much God loves us, our love for him will increase. And if our love for him will increase, our desire to obey him should increase as well. True love, Jesus is saying, manifests itself in willing obedience. We all have a choice to make. We can choose to be obedient to Jesus, or we can choose to be disobedient to Jesus. He says, if you love me, you're to keep my commandments. Notice whose commandments they are. Jesus says they're my commandments, but we understand the commandments come from God. So even in this verse, Jesus is claiming to be equal with God. If you love me, you're to keep my commandments. 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 through 5 tells us about the commandments. He says, by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For, what, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So the commandments of Jesus, 1 John tells us, are not burdensome. God doesn't give us a list of things to do to try to weigh us down. He gives us what we, the, the things that we should do to actually liberate us, to actually give us freedom. He, sin isn't bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. He doesn't say, don't do this because it's a bad thing. He's saying... This is a bad thing. Don't do it because I love you. I don't want you to suffer the consequences of this. So the question really comes down to, do you want to do what the Lord wants you to do? Do you want to do what the Lord wants you to do? But notice what comes after verse 15, verses 16 and 17. And the way, pretty profound stuff, the way that you can accomplish verse 15 is by verse 16 and 17. What do they say? And I will pray the Father, and he will give another helper, and he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, and he dwells with you and will be in you. The only way that you're going to keep the commandments of the Lord is by the Holy Spirit living in you. A lot of people like to take verse 15 and really play a heavy legalistic trip on you, but they don't realize the context of it. The only reason why you can love God and keep his commandments is if the Spirit of God is living in you, working it out in your own life. Some of my favorite verses, Philippians 2, 12 and 13, says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you want to do verse 15, you have to have verse 16 and 17. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father, he will give you another helper, and he may abide with you forever. I like this. Jesus says, I'm going to pray to the Father that he'll send another helper to you. Jesus is praying to the Father. This is an example of a ministry that Jesus has been doing for some 2,000 years, and that's intercessory prayer. Jesus prays to the Father on our behalf that he would send the Holy Spirit for us. Jesus is interceding. What does interceding mean? Essentially, it's Jesus talking to the Father about you. That's what intercession is. And Jesus does that, the Bible tells us, all the time for us. He, he, he's our advocate, it says in 1 John. He stands before 
and judgment of God, and he's your defense attorney, and he says, my blood covers that person. My blood has cleansed this person. If you remember last week, Jesus talked about how whatever you ask in my name, I will give to you. And now in verse 16, he talks about how he's going to pray that the Father send the Spirit. So I would suggest that the greatest thing that we could pray to the Father for is the indwellment and the empowerment of his Holy Spirit in our lives. Who is this helper that he talks about in verse 16, the Holy Spirit? 1 John 5, 7 says, There are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. The Holy Spirit is indeed God. He is known as the third person of the Trinity or of the Godhead. And he's referred to here as the Helper. The Greek word here is parakletos, and it's only used four times in John's Gospel. Um, in, in verses 14 twice, in, verse, or in chapter 14 twice, in chapter 15 once, and in chapter 16 once. And John uses it one more time in his first epistle. And he doesn't use it in regards to the Holy Spirit, this word paracletus, but he uses it in regards to Jesus in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, when he says that we have an advocate. That word advocate is also helper or paracletus. And that word means to, to come alongside and to, to, to help. So the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us to help us. The Holy Spirit is called to come alongside of us. But I like in verse 16 that Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as a helper, and God the Father is sending a helper for us, which shows us that God knows that we need all the help that we can get, right? And this brings me great comfort. He's like, we're going to do something because these people need help, and we're going to send God the Spirit there to help them. Tim Down. He's a PhD, kind of smart guy, who wrote a book, and he says this, Watches, cars, and Christians can all look chrome and shiny, but watches do not tick, and cars do not go, and Christians do not make a difference without the insides. And for the Christian, that is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is really the key to having an effective Christian life. Notice in verse 16, Jesus says that I will give you another helper. There's two um, Greek words for um, another that could be used. One is heteros, and the other is alas. Heteros would mean another of a different kind. Alas would mean another of the same kind. So when we go this afternoon and have ice cream at Carolyn's house. I'm going to have a big old bowl of vanilla ice cream, and I'm going to go, I'm going to have another, but instead of vanilla, I'm going to have chocolate next. That would be heteros. I had another, but it's another of a different kind. If I have a big old bowl of vanilla ice cream, and I say I'm going to have another, and I get another one of vanilla, the Greek word would be alas, because I got another of the same kind. The word that Jesus uses here is alas. I'm going to send another helper. I'm going to send another of the same kind as me. Very much alluding to that the Holy Spirit is the same substance, the same being that Jesus is. In fact, God. Pretty neat stuff when you dive into the language. Um, he, notice Jesus says, he will come. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not just a force. He is a person. He is God. And he says the Holy Spirit will abide and remain with you forever. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon men in various times, but oftentimes, uh, you see, referred to that the Spirit would leave. Keith Green has a great song that we sing here in this church, and this will probably ruin it for you, uh, but it's created me a clean heart of God, and he's quoting Psalm chapter 51. Um, but there's uh, uh, verses in there that don't apply to us. When, when David wrote, take not your Holy Spirit from me, he could say that because of the time frame, the dispensation that he lived in. But for us as the church, God is never going to take his Holy Spirit away from us. So don't think that it's bad to sing that song because it's just quoting scripture. But it's, that section doesn't apply to us because God is never, ever, he says, the Holy Spirit will remain with you forever. Do you know how long forever is? A pretty long time, right? So he's not going to take him away from you. Verse 17 says, The Spirit of truth 
whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, and he dwells with you and will be in you. The Spirit of Truth, he refers to the Holy Spirit as. He's going to guide God's people in the way of truth. What truth does the Holy Spirit teach us? The Holy Spirit will teach you the truth about who you are, and he'll teach you the truth about who God is. And with those two truths, you'll be able to come to the conclusion that you need some saving, right? That you need to be redeemed. John chapter 16, verses 7 through 13, Jesus says to his disciples again, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Um, on, in verse 13, he goes on to say, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, and he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. The Spirit of truth will teach us the truth of God. Notice in verse 17, though, he, he kind of makes this distinction. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him. So there's a difference between the disciples of Jesus and the world. Some churches don't get this concept, I don't think. Because you see churches more and more wanting to become like <laughs> the world. Jesus makes it very clear. The world and his disciples ought to be different. The, the, the word church in the Greek is... Um, Ecclesia, and it means to be called out or to be assembled together. You're called out from the world, and then we come together as those who are called out, and we assemble together, and we have what's known as the church. We're to be called out from the world, different than the world. You know who does this very well, but impractically? My neighbors, the Amish, right? You can go in the store, and you can immediately say, these people are different, because they choose to be different than the world, but they take it to an impractical state standpoint and just kind of silly in my own opinion, but, um, but, but it's actually a little bit of a good example, at least spiritually, how we ought to be, that, that, that there should be something that even when we're walking down the, the store in Safeway, the people should point at us and say, those people are different, not because we don't have belt loops and, and don't wear mustaches, because the Amish don't have belt loops and don't wear mustaches, but, but because there's something else that's different about us. The world doesn't know him. But you do know him. In contrast to the world, the disciples of Jesus should know the Holy Spirit. You see, as believers in Jesus, we have an insight that the world does not have. We have power that the world does not have access to. We have, if you will, an unfair advantage. And that unfair advantage is God himself living in us. He says the Holy Spirit will dwell with you. That word dwell is the same word as abide. Uh, the work of the Holy Spirit prior to salvation is when the Holy Spirit is knocking on someone's heart's door, wooing them to believe in Jesus. That's what it means when the Holy Spirit will be with someone. He talks about another relationship with the Holy Spirit in verse 17. Not only will the Holy Spirit be with you, but the Holy Spirit will be in you. That's when the Holy Spirit indwells a believer. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit automatically indwells you. When did this happen to Jesus' disciples? Not until John chapter 20, verse 22. After his resurrection, he breathes on them, and he says, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. I don't know why that verse I have memorized in the King James, but I do. And he says, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. But that's not the only relationship with the Spirit. Not only is the Spirit with us, not only is the Spirit in us once we believe but then he talks about something in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, about the Spirit coming upon his disciples. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When did the apostles have the Holy Spirit come upon them? Not in Acts chapter 2 at the day of Pentecost. So the Holy Spirit is with people when, they, when he draws them to Jesus. He comes in you when you believe in Jesus. And he comes upon you when you ask for it, if you will. And Skip Heitzig put it this way. It's just so awesome. With. 
The Holy Spirit comes after us to save us. In. The Holy Spirit comes in us to sanctify us. And upon. The Holy Spirit comes upon us to supercharge us. Amen. With us to save us. In us to sanctify us. Upon us to supercharge us. So a few things that we learn about the Holy Spirit from verses 16 and 17 is that he's the answer to Jesus' prayer to the Father. He's another comforter or helper for us. He dwells permanently with believers. He's called the Spirit of Truth. He's unknown, he's unknown by the world, and he dwells in the believer. Verse 18, Jesus goes on to say, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. You see, back in ancient Judaism, if a group of disciples, a group of pupils would lose their rabbi, if he would die, they would be called orphans. So Jesus says, hey, when I do die and leave, I'm not going to leave you as, as orphans. Why? Because I'm going to send another, the helper, to now be your teacher. So yeah, I'll be off the scene, but you're not going to be teacherless. You're not going to be orphans. Verse 19, a little while longer... And the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live. You will live also. So there's not much more time. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. I'm going to rise again. I'm going to send up into heaven. The world's not going to see me anymore. But you as my disciples, you will still see me. And I'm going to live, he says. As a matter of fact, because I live, y'all are going to live also. <laughs> What kind of life is Jesus talking about here? As disciples, we're going to live also. I think it's twofold. Um, resurrection, he's referring to, but also just a present life in this earth. John 10, 10 tells us that the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. There's a difference between existing and living. And Jesus says, because I live... You as my disciples will live as well. You won't just exist, but you'll actually have life. You'll have purpose. You'll have meaning. Verse 20. At that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. What a great love triangle this is, isn't it? At that day, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, here's what you're going to know. That I am in the Father, that you are in me, and that I am in you. This is pretty profound stuff if you really think about what Jesus is talking about here. And he's going to go into more detail in chapter 15. And we'll get to that throughout the next couple of weeks. So we'll dive into that concept a little bit more as we continue on. Verse 21, he says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Again, Jesus talks about the importance of obeying what he has told us to do. Verse 22, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Yeah, good question, Judas, not Iscariot. Right? I'm glad John makes that distinction because we'd be confused. Wait a minute, I thought Satan entered Judas. Who's this other Judas guy? This is Judas, the son of um, James, he's mentioned two times in the Bible, uh, once in Luke's Gospel and once in Acts. He's one of the 12 apostles, but, but he wasn't uh, very famous, but he comes up here. Jesus goes, you're going to see me as the disciples, the world is not going to see me. Jesus goes, hey Jesus, question, how is that going to work? What do you mean we're going to be able to see you, but the world can't? What are you talking about? Jesus' response, verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Wow. This word home, it's, it's the same word used back in verse 2 as mansion. So when he says, in my Father's house are many mansions, there are many dwelling places, the same word is here when he says, we're going to come and make our home with you. The same word that he uses to describe our eternal dwelling place in heaven he uses to describe the Father and Him making their home with us presently here on this earth. So the Word of God with the Spirit of God is going to manifest Jesus in your life. That's how He's going to reveal Himself to you, yet the world isn't going to be able to see Him. By doing what His Word says, by His Spirit living in you, Jesus will be manifested 
in your life. Verse 24, He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the words which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. He says, look, people who don't love me, those are people that don't really care what I have to say. They don't heed what I say. They don't obey what I've told them to do. Uh, I've just got what I'm saying from the Father, and they don't respect me. They don't love me. Verse 25, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, this Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Notice the Holy Spirit is sent in the name of Jesus. Remember last week when we talked about praying in the name of Jesus. Now we see another thing that happens in the name of Jesus, and that's the Holy Spirit who is sent. If when we pray in the name of Jesus, it means that we're praying according to Jesus' character and his nature and his merit. That means when the Father sends the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, he's sending the Holy Spirit in Jesus' character and Jesus' nature and Jesus' merit. What does this mean? This means that you might go through your life and say, well, I don't want to reveal too much about myself, but hey, I don't think that I'm worthy of having the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit isn't sent in your name. He's sent in Jesus' name. And actually, you shouldn't be worried about not being worthy. And if you think you're worthy, then I'm worried about you. If you think you're worried to have the Holy Spirit, that's a big red flag for me. So don't be worried about not being worthy because he's not sent because of your merit. He's sent because of Jesus' merit. But notice also, if he's given in Jesus' name, he's given in the same kind of nature and character of Jesus, which means the Holy Spirit will work as Jesus worked to continue the work of Jesus through us. So the Holy Spirit shouldn't be doing things that Jesus didn't do in his character and nature. And if you see people claiming that the Holy Spirit is doing things that seem against the nature of Jesus, that's a pretty good sign that it's not the Holy Spirit, it's the flesh, or it's something else, but it's not the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Up to this point, Jesus has been the disciples' teachers for, teacher for some three and a half years. He says, I'm going to leave you, but don't worry, because the Holy Spirit will be sent, and he's going to teach you all things. He'll bring to your remembrance the, the things that, that I have spoken to you. So to be filled with the Spirit, if you will, is to be controlled by the Word. How do you tell if someone's Spirit-filled? Do they obey the Word of God or not? If they don't, they ain't Spirit-filled. If they do, well, they probably are. Verse 27, peace... I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither <coughs> let it be afraid. Okay. Jesus tells them peace. Obviously, probably at this point, their faces look pretty disturbed. Their faces look pretty troubled. And Jesus goes, no, 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 no. This is good news, guys. Guys, just realize that, that, that it's actually good. He'll say in a couple chapters, it's to your advantage that I leave. It's going to be better because the Holy Spirit will now come and live inside of you. So have peace. Not only peace, though. He says, my peace I give to you. This would be a, a common greeting and departure term for that culture. In, in Hebrew, they would say shalom. And that meant both hello and goodbye. It's like aloha for the Hawaiians, right? Which, by the way, do you know why we say goodbye? That doesn't make any sense at all. If you just think about, what does that mean? Goodbye? It's like I say you betcha, and I have no idea what that means, but I say that when people tell me so. But goodbye comes from the, the, the phrase, God be with you, and we've contracted it down to just goodbye. But back in early England, it would be God be with you, and that makes a lot more sense than just goodbye. What's that supposed to mean? Anyway, peace, he says, I'm going to give to you. But not just any peace, the, 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 the peace that I have. Jesus says, the peace that I possess, my peace, I'm going to give to you. Not as the world gives, but as I give. We've all experienced worldly peace. You've been on a vacation, you've been sitting someplace, you, life is peaceful, and you're peaceful. But the peace that Jesus offers is even in the midst of turmoil and hard times, you can still have peace. 
So when I get a call Saturday morning and tell me that the K house is kind of flooding and that the roof has fallen in in one of the classrooms, guess what? I still have peace because it's not based on my circumstances. I can still have peace in the Lord. This happened yesterday, by the way. We're working on it. It's all good. But Why can Jesus give us his peace? Because in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says of Jesus, For unto us a child is born... Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Because Jesus is the Prince of Peace, he can give us his peace. What is this peace like? Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. He says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God makes zero sense to the world because as everything is going bad around you, you can still look at it and say, I know I'm going to be okay. I know things are going to be okay. Jesus is our peace. In Ephesians 2.14, it says, For he himself is our peace. He has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. In John 16.33, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The peace that Jesus offers to us. Verse 28, you have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said I am going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Their troublesome parts are due to the fact that Jesus keeps telling them that he's going to leave them. Jesus goes, here's the deal, guys. If you loved me, you would actually be happy for me. Because I'm going from here to there. And then he says, the Father is greater than I. There's some controversy and debate that goes on with this verse. Because people say, well, this proves that Jesus isn't God. Because he says that the Father is greater than him. The Father is greater than him in authority as far as how the God has laid out. The Father is greater than him practically in the, in the verse. Because when Jesus took on... Humanity and his incarnation, Hebrews tells us that he made himself lower than the angels, like us. So in the sense of Jesus' bodily incarnation here on this earth, the Father is greater than him because he set aside, Jesus said, his godliness. But after he was glorified and ascended back up to the Father, he now is equal, but they have different... The Father is still greater in, in authority as far as how the Godhead is laid out. It's, like, it's just like a marriage. It, uh, you got the man and you got the woman. The, the man is over the woman. They are None is greater than the other, but the man's authority, biblically speaking, um, it is greater than the woman's. So. <laughs> Practically, however you work that out, I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Verse 29 goes on to say, And now I have told you, before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. Jesus tells him, Look, the reason why I'm telling you all this stuff is so that when it does happen, your faith will be strengthened and it won't be weakened. Verse 30, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. Just because my time is short, I don't have a, a lot of time left because the ruler of this world, which is who Satan is coming for me. How is Satan coming for Jesus? Remember uh, a couple weeks ago in the last chapter, verse 13, Satan entered Judas. So yeah. Judas is on his way to betray Jesus. Yeah. But notice what he says at the last part of verse 30. I love it. In regards to Satan, Jesus says, he has nothing in me. He's got nothing in me. He's got nothing on me. If you will, right? There, there's nothing... Me and Satan, we're, we're separate. There's nothing yeah. in me. And as redeemed children of God, we should be able to say the same thing. Yeah. Satan's got nothing in us because we have the Holy <coughs> Spirit inside of us. Verse 31 says, But that the world may know that I love the Father, 
And as the Father gave me commandments, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. Jesus says, all of this is taking place so that ultimately the world can understand that I love the Father. The Father has given me commandments that I've shared with you. We should do these things. And he closes saying, arise, let us go from here. So let's apply the word of God, arise and leave this place right after we pray. Heavenly Father, God's like, I'm out of here. No. He's <laughs> going to get the door. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today. God, thank you for your love and your grace, Lord, and uh, God, for your word. Lord, thank you that you sent the helper, God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. Lord, who, who will teach us, who will remind us, Lord, of the things that we've read in your word, of the things that you've taught us. Lord, I pray that we would understand that the only way that we're able to keep your commandments is by your Spirit living in us. God, you working it out in our own life. Lord, our job is to just surrender to you. Lord, to kill the flesh. Lord, to live in the Spirit, to strengthen the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit. Lord, daily. Lord, the Comforter the peace that you leave with us. Lord, for those who are struggling with some tough times right now, Lord, the circumstances don't look good, God, they can have your peace. Lord, you've given them your peace if they belong to you. I pray that they would recognize it. Lord, the peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, that we know, like you comforted your disciples last week, you got a place for us, you're coming for us, you love us, or we, with those things, it really doesn't matter what this world can throw at us. Because we know that heaven is awaiting us. God, I thank you for, um, Lord, just everything you've done for us. And Lord, these, these, these people that you brought here today, Lord, I pray that you continue to work in their lives. Lord, that you administer to them. Lord, if they're, if they're feeling powerless, Lord, that they would pray for the Holy Spirit to come into their lives, Lord, to, to come upon them, to empower them, to supercharge them, Lord, to do the work that you've called them to do. God, thank you for your love. God, you praise your word. God, the availability of your word. I have five or seven or ten Bibles in my office right now, and there's people in Kenya that are trying to share a Bible. Lord, I thank you that we have your word so available, and I thank you that we get to partner in making your word more available, Lord, to those who are dry and thirsty and want it. Lord, be with us this afternoon out at the ice cream social, Lord, that we could just love each other, that we could get along, Lord, that we would just fellowship and, and edify each other and just have a great time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You guys have a good week. Do not